In some ways, dogs are like people. They come in all shapes and sizes and personalities, and like us, looks can be deceiving, especially when it comes to temperament. For example, take America's most popular breed, the Labrador Retriever. He's so cute. They're renowned for being outgoing and affectionate. Consider pit bulls. Those dogs have a reputation in some circles as dangerous, aggressive, and unpredictable, but equally cute. Of course, pit bull lovers will tell you bad dogs come from bad owners. And there are plenty of horror stories about Labradors. I could tell you a few. But now, a new study calls our stereotypes about breeds into question. All of them. According to the citizen science project Darwin's Ark, a dog's breed dictates only 9% of its behavior. 9%. The study compiled more than 18,000 survey responses from dog owners and saliva samples from about 2,000 dogs. The researchers sequenced the dog's DNA, kind of like a canine 23andMe. Let's discuss the results with a senior author of the study. Dr. Eleanor Carlson is a professor of bioinformatics at the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School and the Broad Institute. Professor Carlson, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So 9%, huh? Break down those findings a little bit more. How did you reach that number? And then what's the other 91%? Yeah, that's a really good question. And as a scientist, I'm going to be really annoying and say we're still working on the other 91%. <laughs> that's not uh, annoying. No. That's honest. I, I actually appreciate you saying you don't know yet. But go ahead. Yeah, so I mean... So we got into all of this work many, many years ago when we were actually interested in studying something called compulsive disorder in dogs, because I work at institutions that are interested in human health. And we kept on getting stuck because we were studying this, this disorder, but we didn't have enough dogs in our study. And one day I ran into somebody leaving work and I think, you know, they kind of asked, what do you do? And I was like, dog genomics. And they did exactly the same thing that everybody else does every time I tell them what I do. And that is that they pulled out their phone showed me a picture of their dog and started telling me all about their dog. And that was when I got this idea. I was like, I should not be having this problem that I don't have enough dogs signed up for my research. Everybody wants me to, wants to tell me about them. And so we set up that project and actually just asked people to, to come to our website and, and tell us all about their dogs. And it won't surprise anybody that this was, this was very successful. People do love to talk about their dogs. And we had so many dogs signed up that we could actually take on this question that I've been curious about for a while, which is we knew that the breeds looked really different, but I wasn't totally convinced that their behavior was that different. Yeah, and well, and, and also I kind of, I'm, I love the idea behind this survey because we've been breeding dogs for a very, very long time, but we haven't had the kind of genetic understanding of dogs that we have now for very long. So I imagine that as this research continues, there may be a lot of revelations in terms of what we thought we knew just kind of from the outside. And then once you start to kind of genotype things, what that reveals. Yeah, no, I think it's one of the really exciting things about being involved in science right now. You know, I always tell people, students in my group, that one of the fantastic things about being involved in genomics is that we're not going to run out of questions anytime soon. You know, we're just starting to scratch the surface of what we can discover by actually looking at the DNA of, of individual dogs. And I think that was what we really wanted to do was rather than putting dogs into categories and into groups defined by these breeds, which are actually not very old, they're only about 150 years old, we wanted to actually be able to study dogs as individuals. Talk more about Darwin's Ark and the goals of this, the idea behind crowdsourcing science, this idea of citizen science behind learning about animals. Yeah, so the complicated thing about studying something like behavior, as I think probably most people can appreciate, is it's what we call in science a complex trait. And that means that it's controlled, first of all, by many, many different genes and changes in many, many different genes, but it's also really heavily influenced by your environment. You know, your maternal environment, your early puppyhood, uh, the, the, whether you've had traumatic events, you know, who you're living with, all that kind of things. And that makes it really difficult to study. And the way we overcome things that are really, really difficult to study when you study genetics is to get really, really big sample sizes. And it works beautifully. And it's been proven very successful. Companies like 23andMe have shown that over and over again. And so we wanted to be able to take that approach that they were using in people and actually bring it over to the dog world. And so we set up this project, Darwin's Ark. And 
Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I apologize. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I know we're just short on time. I did want to ask you more about some of the research you're doing before our time is up. I see on your site that there is a project regarding working dogs. There's a project regarding dogs and cancer. How do people get involved with this if they'd like to be part of the project? Yeah, so anybody can come to our website and sign up. It's, a, it's an open data project, so we work with all other scientists to try and make dog science better. Um, and we have a number of different projects on there. If you go in and sign up your dog, you can sign them up for any of these projects, the cancer project, the working dog project. And basically we're trying to, to figure out what we can actually learn from our dogs in terms of helping both them, but also helping human health problems as well. What is your expectation? And again, I, I appreciate that you said you don't yet know, but are there any early indications in terms of how much owners affect their dog's behavior? I know some people who say, well, I just want this kind of breed and I'm just gonna love them and train them the best that I can and we'll just make it work. What is your best hypothesis in terms of how much we actually do control the outcomes of how our dogs behave? Yeah, so the 9% was the part that we showed was explained by breed, but there's actually a lot to genetics other than breed. And I think overall we, we came up with about 25 to 50% of most of the traits that we were looking at in the study seem to be controlled by genetics. So that leaves another at least half of it controlled by, by the owners and the dog's world and the dog's you know, puppyhood. Can I just say, uh, this has absolutely nothing to do with our conversation, but the video that we're running on the screen next to you, we are all having a very good time looking at these very happy dogs. The dog in the sand, I don't know if you saw, the one, the, the Labrador who was just on his back yes. having a wonderful time. He is my new role model. I want to learn to be, yep, that's him. That's, I yep. love sand He's and sand loves me. It, it's perfect. It's per that is the life that I want to live. Professor Eleanor Carlson from UMass Chan Medical School. Best of luck with the science. I appreciate you making time for us. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.